This presentation is looking at my uh, forthcoming book, uh, Uniting Against the Reich, which is coming out with uh, uh, University Press of Kentucky uh, on October 31st. And so this is kind of, I guess you could say, a big picture look at what I'm going to be um, arguing and looking at in the book. Uh, so uh, one of the things I, I guess I'll go full screen real here, real quick here. Um, one of the things that uh, when I first got started into this research, because that's something I guess I get asked a lot um, based on uh, why I went the direction I did in the air war, is I get asked a lot of, you know, why did I choose the subject that I did with regards to command unity, unity of command? It's kind of an unusual take on the air war and looking at basically command relationships and coordinating air operations. Um, when I first started my research, I actually wanted to write my master's thesis on Jimmy Doolittle and his uh, effectiveness in 1944 and argue that he single-handedly turned around the air war in 1944. And uh, my advisor at the time, uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Cetino, uh, who's now at the National War II Museum, uh, he said, I should probably look at the failures of 1943 before I start looking at 1944 to understand those differences. And when I got in the archives, uh, I was kind of surprised by what I found in that uh, 1943 and even going back as early as 42, there seems to be an inability to coordinate air operations between the various American air forces against a common enemy, uh, the Luftwaffe and uh, the German economy. So what happened as a result is uh, basically I went in with one thought process where I was going to look at just do little and the differences do little made. Um, and instead I went looking at bureaucratic changes, command relationships and how an organization uh, failed to function in 1942 and 1943 and then how it was able to fix itself at the end of 43. And as a result, I started looking at something different than what other historians have looked at with regards to what the difference between 1943 and 1944 was. So I'll just lay out the historiographical problem, uh, the historiography problem uh, that we have is much of you who have, who have any interest in the air war or anybody who has looked at the air war, um, a lot of what we see is that it gets boiled down into kind of uh, the difference between 43 and 44 get boiled, gets boiled down into basically these three arguments. The most, uh, the one that gets the most attention is the long range escort fighter, uh, the lack of a long range escort fighter. That is a real problem in uh, 1943. Uh, it is something that the Americans struggle with uh, because you cannot escort your bombers all the way to the target without coming under attack by German fighters. And so this is a major problem. This is what we call a hardware problem. Uh, the P-51, uh, the North American P-51 uh, Mustang uh, gets introduced at the end of 43 and really makes its presence known in 44. And as a result, uh, that's when we, we like to point to that as the major difference. And it, it is a major difference. I can't emphasize how important the P-51 is, but it's not the only thing that changed between 43 and 44. Uh, another thing that gets pointed out is an increase in the number of aircraft, not just long range escort fighters, not just in types, but also just in mass. Uh, the Americans had a lot more B-17s and B-24s to put into the air war between 1943 and 94, and that number only increases as the war continues. So that too is a major factor in turning things around. Again, this is a hardware uh, improvement. One thing that's get, that does get looked at with regards to, I guess we could call software or kind of something that is not a necessarily hardware uh, problem is changes in fighter tactics. Uh, the 8th Air Force does adopt more aggressive fighter tactics by letting the fighters break from the bomber stream to pursue German fighters in 44. This is one of the changes that uh, Doolittle made in 1944 with the 8th Air Force. Now, I will say there is a slight problem with this narrative. And I always like to point this out. The problem with this narrative is that not all units are following these fighter tactics and are still showing some effectiveness, particularly if you're familiar with the film Red Tails or the Tuskegee Airmen, 
the uh, 99th Fighter Squadron, and I believe it's the it's the 99th Fighter Squadron and the and the group that they are a part of. Uh, the they are able to perform quite well uh, using the more conservative fighter tactics of sticking to the bombers. And we'd like to talk about that from the perspective of the civil rights movement. But one of the things that I find interesting is that if you're going to say Doolittle's fighter tactics worked in changing the air war and turning things around between 43 and 44, then why aren't we including how, where does the 99th fighter squadron and the red tails fit into all this uh, narrative? And so I think that is a interesting way to look at fighter tactics and maybe look at that a little bit more deeply and answer that question a little more deeply. And I think there's a lot of potential for anybody that ever pursues that topic to look at, okay, we got the 8th Air Force using one set of fighter tactics, one entire group of fighters using a different one, both seem to be doing pretty well. Now, what's going on here, you know? And also, why, why are the Red Tails having to use a more conservative set of fighter tactics? And again, that gets you possibly more into uh, civil rights history. So again, I think that's a fascinating topic that I'd love someone to take a deep dive into. Uh, I don't know if I ever will, but I, again, it's one of those ones that you you find out about and you're like, you know, someone should really research that. That's, that's obviously at least a paper or a master's thesis or even a book someday. Uh, the thing that I'm looking at, particularly in this book and in this presentation, is the role of command unity, which remains an understudied topic in assessing the effectiveness of allied air campaigns in the European theater. And I do need to be careful when I say European theater. Um, there's two, you have to be careful because I'm going to say European theater to broadly include the European theater of operations and the Mediterranean theater of operations because the ETO and MTO are separate. And we will find that out in this presentation. But for the purpose of just kind of saying everything in kind of the Europe Mediterranean area that's what we're going to be largely talking about in this presentation, uh, because it's really easy just to say Pacific Europe. Well, Europe includes multiple theaters within itself, as does the Pacific. So it can be uh, that you can really have problems if you're not careful with describing the theater of operations within those uh, different areas of the war. So what is command unity at this point? Uh, and again, this is something I should probably explain before we jump into it which is um, command unity or this concept of unity of command is this idea that you have one central figure that is basically setting kind of the objective of what everybody's gonna be doing. Uh, eventually, what we will see with regards to the air war is that central figure will be Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, starting in late 43 and early 44. Uh, now, this does not mean micromanaging the air war. He's not planning missions. He's not getting enmeshed into every little detail of planning. His job is just to kind of say, here is kind of uh, the main purpose of what we are doing. Here is the main target, what we're doing. So kind of the big picture objectives. And then it's on his job to make sure that the commands underneath him properly coordinate their efforts to achieve that larger objective. So again, He's providing kind of the big picture objective, big picture mission, and then everybody underneath is now trying to achieve that objective, and it's his job to make sure everybody stays on the same page. If Eisenhower is micromanaging air missions, something is terribly wrong. And so, again, I put up uh, right here, just this is something that the United States Air Force takes very seriously after World War II for very good reasons. And I looked this up last night. Um, and just to double check it, this is the uh, United States Air Force Doctrine Publication 1. You can find this online. It's not exact. It's, it, this is something they're very clear about. What they want to do is make sure there is a unity of purpose. When we go after objective, we all go after it together and we try to achieve the same goals. So, again, you don't want people pursuing, shall we say, separate campaigns. We don't want people off doing their own thing uh, or you end up with uh, a lot of problems. And so, again, that's what you're trying to do is kind of basically everybody moving in the same direction and those lower commands will be more enmeshed in the details of individual operations, individual missions. And as you go further down, they're getting more and more into those details. But Eisenhower's goal is to make sure everybody's on the same page. 
And when you consider what he had to do just with the air war alone, then you throw in what he's having to do with the ground war, making sure everybody's on the same page, everybody's moving in the same direction. I come away with a lot of respect of Eisenhower's ability, not just to command, not just to uh, keep everybody on the same page, with his ability to not lose his temper too drastically and maybe hurt one of his own subordinates. <laughs> because keeping guys like Patton and Montgomery on the same page is a headache. You know, for those of you who are familiar with the movie Patton, the same is true in the air war. There are personality differences and some people don't like each other. And he has to kind of go in there and be the adult in the room and tell people, you got to stay on the same page. This is what we are going to do. And so uh, there, it, there are several times where Eisenhower tells his superiors, I've had enough of these guys. And he has to kind of take a deep breath and calm down because it's very stressful dealing with some of these egos in the room. And so that's what Eisenhower is trying to do, basically be that central command authority that says, this is what we're going to go after. This is the targets we're going to go after. And this is kind of the direction we need to go. I bring this up because there's an example of this not working. I'm not going to go into all the details of the fighting in Ukraine. That's not my main field of expertise. That's not my, that's not what I do for a living. But we are seeing similar problems with this idea of unity of command in the war in Ukraine, uh, the, the current phase of it, uh, 2022 to present. It's been ongoing since 2014, but obviously things have changed since 2022 as the invasion got more, uh, shall we say, it escalated uh, quite a bit. But the Russians have struggled with this quite a bit, and this is part of the reason why we see a lot of commanders coming in and out in uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and one of the problems that we saw most recently is with private mercenary groups like the Wagner Group, um, they have their own command system, they have their own bosses, and they have their own leaders, which are separate from the Ministry of Defense. And as we saw most recently, that can lead to problems. So this is like really bad. This is like the what you do not want. And again, that's not even getting into the rivalries within the Ministry of Defense. And so if, you, if this is not taken care of, this can really hurt your ability to use advantages that you have in men, material, equipment to successfully prosecute a war. And so this is something that we are seeing live right now still showing itself as a problem, which is if you do not have this uh, concept down, if you're not able to employ basically this a system of command effectively, then these rivalries will tear apart your ability to coordinate operations effectively. And it's one of the many problems with what is going on in Ukraine today. So again, that's all I'm gonna do with that, but it is something that, yes, I have noticed with my own research. So let's kind of begin with looking at the factions that we see in the air war at the beginning once the Americans enter. Uh, there are three main factions that, uh, shall we say, are at odds with one another. Um, in 1942 going into 1943. Uh, you have Royal Air Force's Bomber Command. They developed a bombing doctrine called night area bombing. Uh, they largely did this, I call it kind of a pragmatic and cruel doctrine. Um, basically, it's pragmatic in the sense that it reduces their own losses, but still allows them to carry out a strategic bombing campaign and strike at Germany. It's cruel in the sense that they are going to be targeting civilians. They are going to be attacking civilian areas. Uh, and so we will see large scale firebombing missions carried out by Bomber Command. And again, you also have to remember bombing technology at this time. Night bombing technology is very crude. And typically when you switch from day bombing to night bombing at this time, your accuracy is gonna be almost impossible. And so with the radar systems that they do have, with the crude radar system they have, the one easy target that they can hit at night and preserve their forces is German cities and German civilians. And so the idea is that they will attack German civilians with the intent of reducing their morale to a point that that would affect some kind of government change. That never ends up uh, being the case. It does not work. But again, that gives you an idea of the doctrine that they are developing. And again, it's a way to preserve their own strategic bombing force and still strike at Germany and 
in some ways punish them for what has happened to the United Kingdom during the Blitz and during the Air War itself. The United States uh, Army Air Forces develops a very different doctrine. It's called daylight precision bombing. Now, something I should point out, precision bombing in World War II is not precision bombing today. Uh, we are talking about using uh, the Norton bomb site, which while it famously said it could drop a bomb down a pickle barrel, uh, that accuracy is not really the case. Accuracy is getting your bombs within about 1,000 feet of the target. You don't even have to hit the target to have a successful mission. It's basically like you're shooting a shotgun in many cases at a target from way far away, and you're hoping the spread gets over the intended target area. That's the best way I know how to describe it. Now, along with precision bomb, you're not just going to be trying to hit specific targets. You're also going to be trying to target specific economic systems. So the idea is that you're going to try to bring about an end to the war by targeting what they call our nodes, key economic systems or key production systems that if you knock this one system out, it will basically bring about an end of the German ability to wage war. Um, what they will find out is that that is harder to implement than they previously believed because what they will learn, as many do in air campaigns, is that uh, the other side gets a vote, not just in terms of defense, but also in repairing uh, damaged buildings and damaged uh, facilities. And so uh, that is what the AF Air Force will be trying to do. They'll be the principal strategic bombing Air Force up until 1944 for the Americans in Europe. Um, they're initially not going to be bombing uh, major strategic targets that they want to bomb in 42 and early 43. They're largely going to be supporting Operation Torch much against their will. Uh, the way they're supporting Operation Torch is they're going to be attacking German submarine uh, pens and naval facilities along the coast of France to kind of sort of prevent the German subs from making a major effort against uh, allied operations in North Africa. Uh, this is something that the 8th Air Force despised. This is not what they wanted to do. And so it builds tension between them and the next faction that I'm going to talk about, which is uh, the Allied Air Forces uh, participating uh, in the Mediterranean theater of operations. This includes the 9th Air Force operating uh, further on the northeastern African side. Uh, and then uh, you have the 12th Air Force, which is created by pulling bomb groups from the 8th Air Force, uh, which doesn't make them happy. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, those Air Forces aren't doing any strategic bombing. They're doing long range missions to attack supplies, uh, what we call air interdiction missions, which is they're attacking supply lines, communications, uh, ports, uh, anything that kind of slows the flow of supplies and weapons and reinforcements to the front line. Um, and so, and on occasion, I should point out, they are doing close air support, but usually you, that's usually not a good thing. Uh, with, as I mentioned, with the accuracy of these bombs and these bombers at uh, high altitudes, uh, if they have to do carpet bombing, uh, which is basically using these bombers to bomb a section of the battlefield uh, as close air support, usually things are going pretty wrong on the battlefield because uh, that's basically like, I don't know a good way to say it, but it's, it's like taking a sledgehammer to a you know regular hammer problem. Uh, so again, it usually means something went terribly wrong. So these three factions have different goals, different objectives, and they don't seem to want to work with one another. This all comes to a head at the Casablanca Conference uh, between 14 and 24 January of 1943. Now, the traditional narrative that we've seen of the Casablanca Conference is that this is a debate over night and daylight bombing, and that somehow American daylight bombing was in doubt. Churchill did have strong reservations about it. He did object to it. He did try to convince Roosevelt to change uh, the American bombing doctrine. The problem is, is that almost all the American commanders were not going to do that. Even the British themselves, a lot of the British air officers believed that this was a bad idea. All it would do would anger the Americans and achieve nothing. And so what happens is, is and again, this is the traditional narrative, is out of this conference comes that concept of round-the-clock bombing. 
The Americans will bomb by day, the British will bomb by night, and this keeps Churchill happy. What actually happens if we take a closer look at Acre's notes and his memos and everything that he wrote, everybody cites the same memo from the Casablanca conference that Acre presented. Acre is picked, uh, the commander of the 8th Air Force, Ira Acre, is picked uh, by Hap Arnold, the commander of the Army Air Forces, to make this pitch to Churchill on let us keep doing our daylight bombing. The thing is, Acre knew very well that that was probably not going to change. But what Acre saw was an opportunity to basically uh, create a path for him to break away from supporting Operation Torch. So if you take a look at those memos that Acre wrote, a lot of historians cite the same one, which is called the case for daylight bombing. What they don't look at, and again, this is one of those things that it just happens in history. You know, we get focused on one set of documents and we sometimes don't look at some of the others. If you look at the full extent of his notes at Casablanca and the presentation that he made to Churchill, a lot of it has to do with criticizing Operation Torch and the fighting in North Africa. And he made it very clear that he wanted to go right after Germany and go after German aircraft production and German ball bearings. And he wanted nothing to do with supporting the North African campaign and the Mediterranean theater of operations. And in fact, he wanted bombers to start coming back to his Air Force. He wanted his Air Force to once again become that premier Air Force. And he did not like the idea of bomb groups being diverted to the 12th Air Force. And so this is the real debate that we see. And Acre's solution is this. Let's all go our own separate way. Bomber Command can go do night bombing. The 8th Air Force can go do strategic bombing against Germany. And the, Mediterranean, and the air forces in the Mediterranean theater of operations can support the ground forces, and we'll all be happy. Everybody liked the solution, but the problem is it's a kind of agreement to disagree. It's a, we can't work together, therefore let's not work together, which is actually bad because it means you're not concentrating on one system. You're not concentrating on basically one objective. You're going after all your different objectives. So no one really supports anybody in 1943. And what's interesting is that some of these commanders do ask for help, but they all go back to the Casablanca conference and they go back to the compromise and the documents that laid out this compromise, which say, listen, I'm not going to support you because I'm under no obligation to, you know. And so you see this, basically, these air forces and these commanders all go their own separate way. And the results are, as you would expect, the air war in 1943 will be less effective. And so we start seeing early problems uh, in 1943. Throughout much of the spring, Acre builds up his forces. And in the early summer, he builds up his forces to the best of his ability. But he is complaining from the moment the Casablanca conference ends till he starts uh, really ramping up his air war against Germany in June that, the, that Eisenhower and the air forces in North Africa are stealing his bombers. Uh, he actually says that and makes an accusation to Hap Arnold several times that uh, the head of, the, the person who's basically uh, running uh, the American Air Forces and coordinating the American Air Forces in North Africa, uh, Carl Spots, uh, and he's kind of the chief airman for um, Eisenhower in North African campaign and also in uh, the Mediterranean theater, he, uh, he accuses Spots directly. Uh, this is not passive aggressive, you know, as my wife tells me, you know, uh, we uh, we in New Jersey don't do passive aggressive, we just do aggressive. And this is, uh, you know, this is flat out aggressive. He says very clearly to Spots, and they're good friends uh, from before the war, that you're stealing my bombers, you're diverting bombers to your units, you know, and they, this really builds up and it gets pretty ugly, despite the fact that they're on friendly terms. And the same with Eisenhower. And these fights go all the way to George C. Marshall. And so Acre finally now has to implement this uh, air campaign. And he doesn't have nearly enough bombers that he was asking for. He was expecting uh, thousands and he's in the hundreds. Uh, and so uh, Acre does the best with what he can. And he does try during uh, late July of 1943, we're in the midst of this anniversary coming up, uh, the 80th anniversary of uh, the Hamburg raids, uh, but uh, and Blitz Week, but he does try to coordinate with the RAF uh, in a daylight and nighttime bombing campaign against German targets in northern Germany. 
uh, what they find out is that the firebombing raids and the smoke created by the firebombing raids obstructed the ability of the Americans to carry out daylight precision attacks with their northern bomb sites because the smoke would obstruct their view of the targets. And so uh, the Americans largely see this as a failure. Now, the famous raid that happens in this period, the, or rather infamous raid, is the Hamburg raid, uh, which took place, the series of Hamburg raids took, took place from 24 to 25 July 1943. The firebombing by the RAF and also the uh, precision bombing by the Americans against the port facilities culminated in a, and created, combined to create a firestorm, which killed approximately 50,000 German civilians, and I believe it made 900,000 uh, refugees, if I recall correctly. It completely destroyed the city. Uh, the temperatures uh, astonished me uh, uh, when I looked at them. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but if you ever get a chance to look them up, it will astonish you how hot that city got uh, that day with the fire and the heat. And so erasing a city, in theory, you would think, considering what the RAF is trying to do with their doctrine, you would think that that would be some level of success, that the Americans would come away thinking we completely eliminated a German city. In fact, they come away thinking it's a complete failure. Um, the British, uh, their reaction, I think, is they, they saw a lot of success in it, but the Americans don't. Um, and the main reason they don't see success in it is they don't believe they were able to really effectively use their doctrine. And they found that coordinating their air operations with the British was really difficult because of the smoke from the night bombing. And so the Americans come away from Blitz Week thinking that it really wasn't successful. They had suffered some, some not uh, too heavy losses, but I would say considerable losses, but they weren't, uh, they did not see it as a success. It did not achieve what they wanted to achieve. The first, the next big crisis, I'd say this is the, this is the real big crisis that first develops in late 43, start, and starts late in the summer of 43, is the controversy over the Ploesti raid. Um, many are familiar with the low-level attack uh, and what happened. But what a lot of people are not familiar with is how controversial it was back then and how controversial it was afterwards. I recently did a piece for Military History Now looking at the 80th anniversary. And one of the things that I was shocked by when I did a little research into it was the damage afterwards that the losses at Ploesti did to the air war effort. No one really wants to do this raid. Uh, Carl Spots um, uh, really wants to push this raid because he wants to go after Romanian oil. Uh, Arnold, too, seems to want to really go after Romanian oil. They see it as this key point. If they can destroy the Ploesti oil refineries in one decisive strike, it will create a oil crisis, which will prevent Germany from being able to fuel its war machine. The flawed logic with this is that they're assuming that the Romanians can't ramp up production after an attack, and two, that they can't repair those facilities after an attack. That's something the Americans will learn after Ploesti. Eisenhower didn't actually support the Ploesti raid initially. Uh, he actually only wanted the B-24s for the raid for supporting air operations in Operation Husky, and later on in operations in Sicily as well. Again, we're in the midst of those 80th, 80th anniversaries. Um, so. Uh, this debate goes again all the way to Marshall, and what they had agreed to was a transfer of three 8th Air Force B-24 groups to the 9th Air Force to carry out this low-level attack. But Eisenhower had no intention of using them on Ploesti. He was using them before the raid to support operations uh, in uh, the Mediterranean theater of operations. And so Akers seems to think he's been had again. And he is really angry about this. He and Eisenhower take this again all the way to Marshall. And uh, basically Marshall tells Eisenhower, use them or lose them. And basically his argument is this. They were, these three B-24 groups from the 8th Air Force were transferred for the purpose of the Ploesti raid. Use them or give them back to Acre and the 8th Air Force. Acre is has some justification in demanding these B-24 groups back. He himself had been asking to use those B-24 groups. He had planned raids with those B-24 groups. He had a lot of operations planned for August to go after German aircraft, the German aircraft industry, 
and also uh, ball bearings. So he had a really big August push that he was planning and he needed those B24 groups back. Um, what ultimately happened is, uh, again, you can read about, there are plenty of places that you can read about the Ploesti raid. There's plenty of documentaries on it. So I won't go into the details of what happened with the specific mission, but the loss of the 53 B24 group, B24s, along with all the damage to the ones that survived and the casualties amongst the air crew took those five B-24 groups off the board. And for talking about chess, they are effectively having to be reconstituted, rebuilt, repaired, and they are not available to either Eisenhower uh, or uh, to Acre. And in fact, Eisenhower needed them to start attacking the Straits of Messina to prevent the German withdrawal from Sicily to Italy. Uh, in fact, the withdrawal began, uh, I believe, uh, the commander of German forces in Sicily ordered the withdrawal on the 1st of August, the day of the Ploesti raid, and he completed it on August 17th. Much of the German army in Sicily was able to escape with their supplies and equipment uh, without any kind of major effort made on those straits. And one of the things you can point to is Eisenhower doesn't have the ability to attack them effectively without those B-24s. Aker likewise actually had to slim down his August operations to one major raid that he had to bet everything on, which is the infamous Schweinfurt Regensburg raid uh, on August 17th. Uh, he had to can uh, the entire B-24 strike force. And um, like the Ploesti raid, uh, he suffered heavy losses with this one as well. But without the additional bombers, he can't do any operations after this really that effectively. And so Acre has to pause operations in late August throughout much of September as well. So you do see a pause by both the Air Forces in the Mediterranean and Acre's own Air Force uh, out of uh, United Kingdom because of what has happened. And they aren't targeting the same targets. They're not focusing their attention. And in fact, they're working against one another. And as a result, Germany can withstand these blows against their targets when they do get hit. But also, uh, you can't maintain operations against a single system. So again, what we are seeing really is the inability of the Americans to really concentrate on a specific target system and pound it and then pound it again. And as a result, Germany is able to withstand the blow in a number of ways. Uh, one, in how they fight the air war, but two, uh, how they deal with repairing damage, how they are able to move production around, and how they're able to find different ways to offset the production losses because one part of the system's getting hit, but not the entire part of the system. And so again, these attacks are not really uh, being as effective. And again, uh, there's this pause. Uh, Arnold does express how unhappy he is. And again, I'll try to speed up. But uh, again, we also see uh, Acre and Arnold uh, get optimistic about succeeding in, uh, in uh, the fall because they get kind of a false indication the German Air Force is gonna collapse. And again, that's uh, Operation Starkey, but basically they run a deception operation. The German Air Force doesn't take the bait. And now the Americans believe that they are on the cusp of final victory in the air. This leads to a series of raids throughout October where uh, there's a major push by the Americans but largely, uh, we see kind of the same results, which is the Americans suffer heavy losses, but Germany is able to withstand each one of these blows and deal considerable damage to the Americans. And again, they are able to move production around with the ball bearings. They're able to buy ball bearings from other countries. And so what becomes quite clear to the Americans is that they need to find a better way to coordinate their operations. And so they are going to completely restructure their air forces. Uh, what they will do is uh, they are going to basically change up their air forces. And I'll summarize this really quickly is they're gonna create a new strategic air force in Italy, the 15th. Uh, they're going to convert the 12th air force also in Italy to a purely tactical air force. And they're gonna move the bombers from the 9th Air Force into the 12th Air Force and the strategic bombers from both the 9th and the 12th into the 15th. They're going to move the 9th Air Force's staff and headquarters 
to the United Kingdom and build a new tactical air force there. So what you end up with is each, uh, basically out of the United Kingdom, you have a strategic air force, the eighth, and a tactical air force, the ninth. You're gonna have a tactical air force out of Italy, the 12th, and a strategic air force, the 15th. And so this allows better coordination and also simplifies how these air forces are structured. Next, Eisenhower's made the Supreme Commander of uh, the Allied Expeditionary Forces. And he is going to assume total command authority of these air forces going forward. And he's gonna structure all authority over the American Air Forces through him. And here's how he's gonna do it. To coordinate with the British, he is gonna name as his deputy commander, uh, Arthur Tedder, who is a uh, Air Chief Marshal in the Royal Air Force. Spots will be the commander of the United States Strategic Air Forces. He will have full uh, control over all the American Strategic Air Forces in Europe, but also through some clever maneuvering, uh, he will reroute a lot of the admin of the tactical air forces through either his office or the new commander of the Mediterranean Allied Air Forces, Ira Aker. Uh, he will uh, also have uh, a big say in uh, how the tactical air forces are used. So what we see now is Eisenhower effectively has command over all these air forces, either directly or indirectly, and so does Spots. Uh, and again, uh, while Charles Portal had been put in charge of the combined bomber offensive, he's largely going to be a bit sidelined. And again, that's through the use of Tedder. And again, I have a note here on another British commander, but I won't go into him because uh, he largely remains irrelevant in the air war in Europe uh, after this command shuffle. The reasons given for the shakeup uh, is largely personal. And it's not personal as in bad, it's in that Spots makes it very clear he can work well with how this new system works. And it's not just Spots, it's Eisenhower, it's Tedder. This system works because everybody can be on the same page at the same time. And that's what Spots says after the war, is he makes it very clear that the reason this thing's gonna succeed is it's because of our personal relationships and our ability to coordinate with each other effectively. And so that is why they changed things the way they did. Every commander was put in a specific Air Force, a specific unit, and a specific staff in this shakeup during late 43 and early 44 with the purpose of basically uh, allowing them all to communicate better and to coordinate their operations against a single target system. And we see that play out uh, when they decided to go after the Luftwaffe in the uh, spring of uh, 1944, late winter, early spring of 1944 in Operation Argument. Now, the first real big test is, is that right as Argument is about to get kicked off and they're really gonna go after the German Air Force with everything they've got, the Germans launch a counterattack in Italy against the Anzio Bice. This sidelines the 15th Air Force from participating. And one of the good things that actually happens during this crisis is Aker, Eisenhower, uh, and Spots are all communicating very fast with what's going on and everybody's staying up to date. Aker holds back the 15th Air Force uh, and it, from participating in argument for the first couple of missions. But later on, what we see is that as soon as he's sure that the German counterattack at Anzio has subsided, and he feels safe to deploy his Air Force to support the attacks against uh, the German aircraft industry, then we see those Air Forces start to really pound the Luftwaffe from multiple directions. The Luftwaffe starts to having to fend off raids from multiple directions on the same day, and it wears down the pilots, and the real attrition isn't the destruction of the aircraft industry or the aircraft themselves. It's killing the pilots and those skilled pilots. Replacing pilots is not easy, particularly veterans that uh, the Germans had had. So again, we see the effectiveness of the Luftwaffe and the German Air Force degrade significantly uh, during this period. Next, they have to decide after the Luftwaffe has largely been degraded to a point where they can now target uh, economic systems and other systems, uh, they have to decide what's next and they decide to target transportation systems, uh, rail lines, uh, bridges, canals. 
to prevent the movement of German troops, but also prevent the movement of strategic materials to the factories. And we see three different major operations all kick off right before uh, the landings in Normandy with Operation Overlord. Operation Strangle focused on Italy from 19 March to 11 May of 1944. Uh, and that targeted Italian rails to try to prevent Italian goods and troops from moving and supply lines from moving. Also, uh, we see on the Eastern Front, the 15th Air Force target Romanian transportation targets, bridges, uh, rail lines, and even mining the Danube River uh, to prevent uh, basically the movement of goods and materials through the Danube River. And so that too is successful uh, in hurting Romania and its exports as well, but also it affects their ability to defend against the Soviet uh, offensives into Romania. And finally, we see the transportation plan being used against uh, German and French rail in the lead up to Operation Overlord, which is also very effective both in helping the allies uh, in their operations right after the landings and preventing German reinforcements from moving swiftly to the battlefield, but also is affecting the ability of German and French rail to move strategic goods uh, to factories and move things at the grand strategic level. So again, we talked about like coal to factories. I mean, destroying these rail lines causes a lot of problems in addition to all the trains that are destroyed as well in the process. This moves us into, as they are doing this, they decide to also shift to bombing oil at the same time, starting in May of 44. The 15th Air Force will attack crude oil production in the Balkans, while the 8th Air Force will attack synthetic production in Germany itself. This is different than what we see at Ploesti. This is a effort against the entire oil network that the Axis controls, and it's going to be sustained. But also, if you look at it and you link it to what's happening with the transportation, when rail lines are out, when rail bridges are out, they're using sometimes motor vehicles to offset the loss of the rails. Well, now you're creating multi multiple problems because now you're burning gas to deal with your rail crisis, but you also now have a fuel crisis because of the attacks on oil. In addition, the 15th Air Force will support uh, Soviet ground forces and their offensives into Romania to try to permanently shut that Romanian oil off, which is so crucial to German uh, the German ability to wage war. In late, in 44, uh, as things are going well, the British decide, let's just break up the whole thing. And uh, it's largely because Bomber Command did have a bit of an independent streak led by its commander, Sir Arthur Harris. Uh, with that said, um, Eisenhower and uh, his staff are able to head this off somewhat at the pass. They do allow Harris to have some level of independence, but what we see after August of 44 is I, uh, Eisenhower's deputy, uh, Arthur Tedder, starts sending out basically these objectives lists and basically saying, here's our top priority. And usually one and two is oil or transportation. They shift between one and two, depending on what's going on in the war. But throughout the fall, everybody's being told, here are your oil targets or here are your transportation targets. And if you can't hit those, here's your oil targets and here's your transportation targets. So again, one and two keep flopping, but it's this flip flopping, but it's the same one and two. So it shows that they really are trying to hammer this, basically this ability of the access to move material strategically and on the battlefield as well. We see this command system deal with crises very well too uh, in the winter of 44. There's the Battle of the Bulge. One of the things that happens in the Battle of the Bulge is they completely restructure the 8th Air Force to deal with a crisis like that. And you can't do that without this new system. And so, in fact, this is one of the only times Eisenhower is given direct tactical command of a unit. And uh, that is the uh, second division of the 8th Air Force, which is the B-24 division. And again, this shows how quickly they can respond to a crisis and it proves quite effective. And the bombing is done quite effective to prevent the Germans from basically supplying their troops. And as a result, Germany really struggles in that offensive uh, to basically, after it kind of gets moving and it kind of starts to punch a hole, one of the things they really run into is logistical problems, uh, not just with oil, but also just continuing the flow of supplies. But we also see this happen uh, in another offensive that happens in uh, early spring, which is 
uh, the German offensive in Hungary to try to reverse their losses in the Balkans. And once again, the 15th Air Force this time, this time it's the 15th Air Force, but once again, we see an American Air Force supporting the Soviets by attacking supply lines, attacking key uh, communication centers with the goal of trying to slow down the flow of supplies to those frontline units, and it proves quite effective. And so, and in fact, the same unit gets uh, hammered by the 8th Air Force, uh, the six, the German 6th Panzer Army that was in the Battle of Bulge, got hammered by the 8th Air Force, turns around and launches this offensive right after the Battle of Bulge, and gets hit by the 15th Air Force. It's almost like they changed hands with how the 8th Air Force passed off that targeting priority to the 15th. It, it, it really does seem that way with how Basically, they move right into the 15th Air Force's range and the 15th Air Force pounces. And so I should point out that this does also lead to, uh, while it does create a more effective ability to wage an air campaign, this also unfortunately does make it more easily easy for the Americans and the Allies to, when they decide to target German civilians towards the end of the war more directly, uh, it... Uh, it allows them to do it quite effectively. And we see this with the bombing of Dresden and Operation Thunderclap as well. And so, as you can see, the system works very well once it gets set up. And once these guys are able to coordinate their operations, they are able to coordinate as far east as Poland and as far west as uh, France, as far north. You know, Again, they can coordinate all over the, the map of Europe and uh, even, uh, even in uh, the uh, North African and Mediterranean theater as well. So again, it's a very effective system once they set it up. And a lot of it's built on these guys all being on the same page and working with Eisenhower and at the direction of Eisenhower and then by, and later on coordinating with each other. So uh, sorry for the speed at the end. I knew I was running low on time, but uh, again, uh, this basically kind of gives you an idea of uh, how we go from a series of air forces that couldn't get along to basically being able to work together and do so quite effectively. So again, here are my conclusions. Basically, uh, again, you see this improved command structure enabled a better coordination and an ability to concentrate their air forces on a specific system, including an, an army at the end of uh, uh, the Second World War that German Six Panzer Army is the one I think of all the time, but also economic systems. And something to always keep in mind with the air war that doesn't get emphasized enough to uh, those who read about World War II is we like to think the air war is separate from the ground war. In fact, the ground war is dictating the air war. And that's why we see Eisenhower as the person who's the ultimate command authority for these air forces. And the final thing I should say is none of this is able to work if the relationships don't matter. You know, not saying they have to be best friends, but you have to have good working relationships and people who could not work in this command system were moved out. And one of those is a person I didn't talk about in this lecture, but his name is a uh, Trafford Lay Mallory. Uh, he did not get along well with the others in the system and he got sh shuffled off to the side and eventually had to take a new command uh, in uh, August of 44. So sorry for the speed read through at the end of uh, uh, the clock. Thank you very much. That was really interesting.